Hi guys, it's Gav here from danceplanet.tv. Thanks for joining me as always. And in today's show, I've got the awesome, the asset, Paul Nicholson joining me to talk darts. How are you, Paul? Very well, Gavin. How are you? Really, really good. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It means loads to me to get, you know, a lot of you top guys chatting darts. It's amazing. Eh, no problem at all. It's a very snowy, cold day, so... Why don't we just sit down, get comfortable, and talk a little bit about darts? Ah, fantastic. What I wanted to do is, first of all, I just wanted to ask, you know, how your darts is going at the moment and what your goals are for 2018. I know you're currently ranked 72. What are your goals for this year? Uh, keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the kind of guy to really set goals. I mean, uh, I used to be in the early part of my career. I'd always say that I, I wanted to win this many events in one year and all that kind of stuff. But I'm a bit more realistic these days, and I've had a few sessions with psychologists over the course of the last few years oh, right. talking about just dealing with the challenge in front of me and right now it's all about just playing against terry jenkins next and then yeah. uh whatever happens after that then i'll go on to the next challenge and not only has that affected my darts but it's affected my actual life uh i'm very much an in the moment kind of guy and as far as my darts at the moment i'm very comfortable with uh, the way I'm playing. Yeah. I've had some decent results this season. I'm buoyed by the fact that I made the UK Open only going to three tournaments, <laughs> <laughs> even though uh, there were six available. So it was a little bit of a gamble, but um, I put myself under pressure from the first dart, and I was up to it a little bit, so I'm pleased about that. But uh, because of injuries over the last couple of years, Gav, yeah. it's it been about trying to find a, a way to throw without reoccurring the injuries. Yeah. Um, I've had problems with my shoulder where I've... Um, when I re changed my grip the first time, uh, is because I had wrist problems. And then with the re grip, uh, I started getting uh, problems with my shoulder. Oh, so I've had to re grip again. So imagine trying to continue being a world class dart player. And having and all these issues, yeah. And changing two different grips. I mean, I know that there are, you know, Peter Wright's a bit of a freak in that respect. He changed his grip pretty much every time he throws. <laughs> but um, I'm not like that. I'd never changed my grip before. And the fact that I've changed it twice now in about 18 months, and the amount of work I've done in the background is a testament to where I am. I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing now, and I'm hopeful that uh, I can get myself back to somewhere near where I was. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people probably realise, like, um, you know, when you hear about these injuries, whether it's like, like, say, in the hand or in the shoulder, people sometimes say to me, how can it really hurt them that much throwing a dart? But they forget it's your job. And, and like, I don't know, how many hours do you practice a day as well on top of going to all these tournaments? Well, not as much as I used to. I'm, right. nearly, I'm nearly 40 <laughs> years of age now, so uh, nowadays it's, it, I do, I'm more of the, the girl in price type of school. I, I tend to pick up a dart for 20 minutes bash the ball for 20 minutes and I'll sit down and have another 20 minutes later and yeah. I'll, I'll break it up over the course of the day and that way there's less chance of repetitive strain in my shoulder and my wrist where I've had problems in the past and uh, because we play so much yeah. as well it, it's about giving your knee a rest and your ankle because you're putting so much weight on your right right side of your Sorry. right hander uh, or your left side side of your left hander so it's about the amount of practice that you need but also the amount of rest not to uh, make sure that you get any injuries but as far as the amount of practice I've done in my life, I've been playing for 35 years since I was three. Wow. Since you were so, three years old? Yeah, I was three years wow. old when I started. So when, you, when you've been practicing for 35 years yeah. and being a pro for nearly 10, then something's going to break down eventually, whether it's your back, whether it's your shoulder, your neck. I've had pretty much every single thing of those. But the one thing that keeps all the pain at bay, and that's yoga. Really? And a lot that, of people have that, said that. That, that one thing... It just allows the body to breathe, and I'm not going to preach about it because I'm not that kind of guy, but no. it's the one thing that's held me together in the last few months. I think that's what I need to do, a bit of yoga, get myself in shape as well. <laughs> <laughs> Flexibility. Well, try to anyway. Remember that. Try to anyway. Well, what I also wanted to talk about is I know that you've been doing, I've watched a lot of your videos with your dance school, and I know that you've got some new stuff coming out for this year. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, please, Paul? Yeah, when the dart show started, uh, I was approached by Matchroom Sport to do this TV show, and my input was going to be, from a pundit perspective, talking about uh, all of the tournaments and all of the different ways that the game is growing. But from my perspective as a professional player, they wanted to see if I could show people different techniques and how to get better. Yeah. And this year, it's all about practicing with the pros and having little challenges with them so I'm putting myself in harm's way you could say <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I mean, the first one, which is uh, going to be this week, and we had a little chat with Gilman Price in the first episode of 2018, but this week I, I spoke to Mike, Michael Smith and we had a bit of a scoring game, so I think you can pretty much assume that I'm going to get absolutely whooped. Oh, his because... scoring's incredible, isn't it? When he's in the zone, he's, he's on, isn't he? Yes, very much so. So <laughs> stay tuned for that one in a couple of days. That'll be fun. But we're going to we're going to speak to a person every month. Uh, I know that next month's going to be Mansa so oh, brilliant. that's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to look at different practice games and ask questions of these pros when we're practicing to see well how they get the best of themselves. But dart school's been great. It's given me an opportunity to get across my opinion of fundamentals in darts and yep. things that you should do and things that you shouldn't do. Yeah. And hopefully, it's helped people get better. And whereabouts can people access these? Is that mainly on YouTube or are they on websites, on a certain website? Or, or, or how's the, the best way about them viewing them all? To, to get these clips now, the best place to get them is YouTube because after the show has been aired, yep. uh, the Dart School or the Paul Practices with segments get clipped and then they get sent to social media. So you, if you follow the PDC on Twitter or Instagram uh, or Facebook, you'll find them on there. But if you want to watch them and re-watch them, the best place to get them is on YouTube. I was thinking as well, Paul, while you've got you on here, I was thinking of actually building you a dedicated section on dartsplanet.tv. So for those of people that want to watch it, the minute you do them, I can set up an algorithm, so it'll pull it off YouTube, um, and then I can share it all through as well, so we can actually watch it direct through there in one place, if that's okay. Yeah, very helpful. I'll do that as well. Like I said, I'll get that algorithm set up after the show. Um, what I want to move on to now is I also want to talk about, obviously, your darts commentary. Um, is it something that you really enjoy? Is it something that you want to do long term? Where are you with Absolutely. That? I mean, I didn't think I'd have to do it so soon. Uh, <laughs> I think Wayne Model would probably agree with me in that respect. I think he, uh, when he was about 32, 33, he probably thought that his career was going to go on for at least another 10, 15 yeah. years. That's exactly what I thought when I was 32, 33. You know, I was flying. Um, injuries have harmed the, the playing side of it, but I'm still going, which is great. But uh, as far as the commentary is concerned, uh, it came along... I was a bit, it was a bit of an accident, really, because I was asked to just fill a gap on ITV for the European Championships oh, back right. in 2011. Yeah. Uh, from there, I was seen to react with the presenter really well. So after that, we came back to the European Championships in 2012 on ESPN. They were short a couple of commentators, so myself and Colin Lloyd were asked uh, to fill in. And from there, I found a real niche with it I, I got to work with Jim Proudfoot and Stuart Pike oh wow uh, yeah and Mike Lawrence that week and uh, they taught me some skills and some things to to do and uh, things have progressed with darts as everybody knows yeah definitely the European tour is now streamed online uh, different projects with different networks came about the World Series was big for me because I got to work on Australian and New Zealand TV uh, but when the European tour really was the, the, the straw that brought the comes back because yeah when they were doing 11, 12 events that, and they needed a the next player and Rod Harrington didn't really want to do all of the travelling. No. I put my hat uh, went into the ring and since then, all of these different projects have come around and I really do enjoy it. I, yeah. I want to do it for a very long time. Uh, I think I've got a really good insight into uh, the way the players think. And I like to inject a little and bit. And you know every single well. stat. I always say you know every stat there is almost, don't you? Any, anything anybody asks you, it's like, yeah. You know, you you know the stats for it all. It's it's just incredible, really. Well, when you're surrounded by it almost 24 hours a day, uh, you're watching it on TV and watching things on the internet. You, I've got a really good memory for things like that. Uh, maybe not as good as the likes of Alex <laughs> White, who can pretty much tell you every dart they've ever thrown. Right. But, uh, um, for me, it's just about taking in vital information and remembering little tidbits that fans would want to know. No, and, that's the key, uh, isn't it? It is, and I like to inject a little bit of northern humour into it now and again I know there's a lot of people out there on social media who think I'm trying to copy Sid which is not true no because I, I don't think anybody ever could no I don't uh, think but, so but not the genuine is... thing is I, I'm a little bit nuts as everybody knows I've, I've got my own uh, little persona I've got my own little ways of saying things yeah and that's exactly who I am I'm, I'm just a little bit crazy and very very enthusiastic about the sport and I just hope that that comes across I don't think Sid saying that the funniest one for me from him that I can ever remember was the um in the two nine darters with the um Phil Taylor and Wade in the, in the Premier League final I think it was with his Geordie eyes for me that one always stands out there were so many but that was just awesome wasn't it yeah, it really was. I mean, so many <laughs> lengths from Sid. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I, I've apparently, I, I, I don't remember this, Yeah. 
but apparently when I was a kid, my brother told me recently that uh, when I was about four or five, I used to copy Sid by watching them on TV, and I'd, I'd walk around the house just trying to copy Sid, so I thought, <laughs> so maybe it was maybe it was just meant to be at some point, but, um, you know, I, some of the lines he came out with were brilliant, but he was given licence for that by the networks he worked for, like the BBC and Sky Sports, they let him do his own thing, yeah. and having Dave Lanning to his left, uh, are, well, in my opinion, the most intelligent darts commentator ever. Yeah, unbelievable. Uh, he, was the, he was the perfect reposter, Sid, and those two will never be topped. No. It's just trying to, like I say, you all find your own way. You, you could be a legend one day, just like Sid, Paul, who knows? Well, I, I don't know about that. Just to be mentioned in the same sentence as him is good enough for me. I mean, Chris Mason and I, who, you know, we work for the radio now together, yeah. and we, we do a little bit of uh, um, stuff for Lakeside uh, for different networks, admittedly, but when we get together, we've got such an enthusiasm for the game, yeah. and we love to talk about things from different angles. I, I just think that the opportunities now to talk about the game that we love... Uh, it's a privilege, and we just don't want to mess that up. Yeah, because um, obviously you first done that with the Ali Pally on the Talk Sport thing, and that's now being done with the Premier League, and hopefully it'll be rolled out for like loads more eventually as well. Yeah, time will tell. I mean, the, the initial signs are good because Talk Sport really are investing uh, some airtime into darts, which is fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. The feedback that we're getting from the fans uh, about our hashtag darts on the radio, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's really, really encouraging because we love what we do. We... Uh, if we get a little bit of license from TalkSport just to have a little bit of um, a shout, and we, we've got to paint the picture. I mean, when I first did darts on the radio for Five Live back at the Michael Van Gogh and Peter Wright World Final with John Rowling, yeah. that was a real big learning curve for me. Yeah. Uh, and I was given some advice before that uh, from Dave Clark because he'd done radio in the past, and he said, paint a picture with your words. And every single time I do a broadcast, I remember those words from Dave Clark. Yeah. And uh, that's our job. We've got to be able to uh, allow the fans to close their eyes, listen to us, so they can see what's going on. And I think we do a really good job of that. We've got a great team with Jim Proudfoot, with uh, Nigel Pearson, John Rowling, myself and Chris Mason, as well as Ian Danta presenting. And even the other guys who joined us at Christmas, like Andy Goldstein, Ray Stubbs, Will Gavin, we're just... We've got a plethora of talent there. How could we not get exactly. it right? We've got those guys at our corner. And I've even heard that there's a few people, whether I should say this or not, I don't know, that are watching the Premier League with the volume down and you guys on Talk Sport. Yeah, we... we <laughs> I've heard it a lot. Christmas, <laughs> we, um, at Christmas, we, we were telling people... Uh, we weren't telling them. No. Uh, they were saying that they wanted to mute the TV yeah. and have us as commentators. And we were telling them, well, you're going to have to pause it for three seconds for it to catch up. Yeah, just so you got the delay, the three-second delay. That, that's that's crazy, though, to think that there's a lot of people, like said, I'm not trying to disrespect it, but that are doing that, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? They've got the best of both worlds then, haven't they? They do. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the commentary on uh, on other networks that we cover. Um, that's, I think they do a great job. Yeah. But admittedly, there's, there's choice now for people as to who they want to listen it's to. what I'm you sure like, isn't the same it? In football, and yep. rugby, and boxing, uh, if you want to listen to a certain person who you like, then yep. the choice is there. So they're more than welcome to do whatever they please. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that. What I also want to know is, um, obviously, with the youngsters coming into the game now, and obviously the standard and, and different things, and a lot of them being ruthless now, what, what advice would you give to people that want to get into it at a professional level? Uh, take baby steps. Uh, right. it, it's very difficult for young kids to you know, really have that explosion, like Van Gogh did when he was 17, when yeah. he was World Masters. That's rare. Uh, it, you know, you look at the, the progression that's available now. The JDC have changed the game. Right. Fuck, fuck. I, I mean, when I was a kid, I had all this talent and nowhere to go. Yeah. And now the JDC have got all of these big professional type events for kids yeah girls and boys can take part as well i've got to iterate that um so these guys can go there they can test themselves they can play county darts they can play local tournaments it's important to take steps and when you get to a certain level you can test yourself at the next level yes don't just jump into q school right off the bat i, I think that's a big mistake that it people is. make uh people have got to make sure that they succeed at different levels yeah and then the final step is to go to the pros. Well, because the thing is, some you could go. I suppose you could go, think you're really good, um, have all the confidence in the world, and then go to like the PDC Scottable tournaments and just get blown away every week. And that is enough. Well, we've seen it in the Premier League with seasoned pros, haven't we? But have gone in in the past, played week in, week out on a really high level, and it just 
not being it destroys them, doesn't it? Yeah, that's true. I mean, we obviously felt for a, a couple of uh, the, the debutants last week because it looked like things were maybe getting a bit too much. But all of the guys in the Premier League know because of their success that uh, everything comes with uh, wins and losses. Yeah. Confidence highs and confidence lows. You've got to be able to manage uh, the losses as well as the wins. I mean, yeah. I was taught it as a kid by the great Graham Stoddart that you've got to learn to lose before you can learn you can to win. win. And yeah. that, is, that is the biggest advice I can give to kids. Yeah. Learn to lose before you can learn to win. Yeah. Now, as, a, as I'm not a parent myself, <laughs> no. but I like to have this conversation with parents about what age do you start teaching your kids about losing? Yeah. Uh, do you let them win all the time or do you look, teach them about losing? It's a very important subject for me because uh, once you learn to lose, I feel you could be a better winner. And for me, it was always playing against my dad. When I was a kid, I had nobody else to play and I was constantly winning. And when I started, I learned to lose. I actually wanted to win even more. Yes. My dad never used to let me win at any... He always used to, When I beat my dad, he said, you've won because... You're better than I am, but he weren't one of these ones that would. And I'm like that when I play darts with the kids and that. If I can hit a 140 against them, I will. I'm like, yeah, I bet. But Connor the other day, um, he he took one out and he's like, I beat you, but he beat me fair and square, you know. And I I think it's important as well. And I say to him, I'm um, always try your hardest to win, but every game has to have a loser. And like you're saying, you have to learn to lose. You can't like. It is what it is. Everybody, you're not going to win everything. It doesn't matter how good you are at any sport, does it? That's absolutely right. Every single professional in every sport will say that they became better winners after they learned to lose. Yeah. Because it makes you want to beat people even more because you don't want to feel like <laughs> no, a loser. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. I'm just, like I say, I, I love it. Sometimes kind of go, oh, he's, I'm never going to beat you. I go, you will one day, yeah, you will. And, and, and then when he does, he's just like buzzing. It. It's, it's fantastic. Same with Ellie, really. Um, can I just ask one thing? What I also want to do is move on to the Premier League. But I put a video out um, only, obviously, a few days ago about the Premier League in Berlin. Now, obviously, it had massive hype, uh, tw nearly 12,000 fans there. But for me, and I put it, and it, I'm not being negative because I'm a huge darts fan, but that night, a lot of the players didn't perform, the, the crowd didn't seem up for it, something seemed missing for me. How, how did you feel about it? A lot of people agreed with me on it. Did it, did it live up to expectations for you or not really? Well, we, we actually listened to the atmospherics uh, of, um, of the arena through our headphones. Yeah. And uh, we were trying to surmise what it was like. There were a lot of people there. And we found with some of the bigger venues that it's harder to gauge the atmosphere. Because right. if you go to Aberdeen, for instance, which yep. is the loudest Premier League <laughs> yeah. I've ever been to. And I don't know whether that's just got to do with the uh, the acoustics in a smaller arena or the fact that all of the Aberdonians are totally crazy. <laughs> no, I think uh, you've got the second one. I reckon they're, my wife's Scottish. I think they're crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, I watched Gary Anderson walk out with, with against Terry Jenkins a few years ago, and it was deafening. Yeah. But as far as Berlin's concerned, I had a very frank conversation with, with Dan Dawson about this last Friday. Right. Uh, after we'd finished work in the Berlin event. And I asked him, what did you think of it? And he said, you know what? Uh, walking through the arena, you just had a sense that there were a lot of people who were there for the first time. Right. Uh, because we have done PVC European tour events in Berlin before, which have been very a lot smaller, you know, yeah. two or three thousand. But this one was twelve thousand yeah, biggest crowd big, ever. There's a lot of there's a lot of corporate people there as well. And you weren't sure how to react with it. Yeah. The the biggest message we got from the night was we absolutely love this, but we're not sure how to react to it. Yeah. And I think very much like Rotterdam has its own cachet. Yeah. It's got all of the orange, it's got the Barney Army and the MVG chants. Yeah. They almost need their own little they, hook in Berlin to God. be able to get themselves going. That's what a lot of people said on the comments of my video. They said, that I think a lot of it is exactly what you said. I, they haven't got their own chance, or like the English have got what we do all the while, and, and like you say, yeah. the Dutch have got the Barney Army and all, and all that. So... I thought it was good. Um, so, will it be back there again next year? Is that going to be a regular one on the calendar? I hope so, because that was one press of arena. It uh, was. It looked good, didn't it? You know, I mean, I've been to Dots matches, you know, for the last 10, 12 years, and you just look around and you think, wow, we're playing here? <laughs> Unbelievable, uh, I mean, isn't it? I was looking, lucky enough to play in Etihad Stadium in Melbourne uh, on the pitch. Uh, and oh, I'm have you? Wow. Wow. How many was in there? How many was in there, Paul, that night? Oh, we had about between three and four thousand for that because oh. it was cut off. Uh, we were on the pitch and all of the uh, the people were in the stand. Yeah. But 
My word. I, I never thought that we'd get to this. And the thing is, we're not going to stop. We are going to get bigger crowds. It's crazy. And, uh, it's going to get to the stage where things have to change because I, I saw a statistic uh, during the week and people were reacting to it. Uh, apparently, there were three gigs at the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin. Right. And uh, they ordered enough beer for the three events. And the darts took care of all of the beer for the <laughs> session. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. That doesn't yeah. surprise me. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 I love, I've been to the O2 to the Premier League and I've also been to Birmingham a couple of years ago. So, yeah, I, I, yeah that's all part of it, isn't it, the old beer for me? I, I love getting up there, getting there a bit early and getting in the old... I love doing... I don't dress up, um, but I do like I do like the banter of it all. Absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, that's one of the reasons it's... Builders the biggest party in town. It's I mean, a show, whatever. isn't it? People, it's yeah, a it show is. as well. A lot of people say, and, and are very anti it, and like, oh, it shouldn't be like that, and people should be more respectful. And don't get me wrong, there is times when I think, look at the crowd, and I think, do you know what? You're overstepping the mark with that player. But at the end of the day, it's yes, they go there to enjoy it and they pay the money, but it's still your guy's job. Do you know what I mean? You, that's that's your earnings and different things, isn't it? And I yeah. do think they're disrespectful at times, but I, I, I love the party mood. I think it's great. The thing about the Premier League that people forget is it's not a ranked event. Yeah. It's uh, it's a big exhibition tour. It's the showcase of the PDC. And when I'm when I say a showcase, it's it's about selling the best players in the world or the most entertaining players and actually giving them the biggest platform possible yeah. to do it in front of bigger live audiences and huge TV audiences to sell darts around the world. Exactly. That's what the World Series is, it's exactly what the Premier League is, and that has a feed on effect for the ranking events. I mean, when you've played in front of 12,000 people like the guys did last week, wow. when, they, when they play at Minehead at this weekend, it's uh, it's almost going to feel small. It is, yeah. So they're probably going to feel less nervous at Minehead than they would usually. I mean, there are so many different angles that we can talk about, but ultimately, I think the PDC have done an amazing job with the I Premier don't. League, yeah. uh, considering where it started. Yeah, well, every everybody you speak to, like, and that is probably you know one of their favourite tournaments. And I love the Grand Slam of darts. That's probably along with the world. I like it because it's a mix of the BDO and the PDC. I like that personally. But the, the Premier League, it's, it's just going to. And who knows how far they'll go? Will they be going to other countries and that? Do you think? It might get to the stage where half of the events are not in the UK. Really? Uh, I personally think that in the future you could have events in Poland, you could have events maybe in Spain. It would not shock me whatsoever. I mean, I think testing different arenas through the European tour is definitely the way to go. I mean, we're going to Denmark this year, yeah. so Copenhagen is going to be a phenomenal event at the end of June. So if that goes well, then maybe the PDC will start looking for an event in Denmark. Wow. Scandinavia is a huge darting market. So there's no reason why we can't put one in Helsinki in the future or potentially in Malmo or uh, Stockholm, Bergen or Oslo. These kinds of places are absolutely crying out for these kinds of events. As long as people come out, buy tickets and support darts. Yeah. And they can have their own chance every single week. But I see... Uh, some of the arenas in the UK being sacrificed for events abroad if it's logistically possible. Yeah, if it, once you really break into like like China's become a mass. I know there's a lot of soft tip, but that's getting huge, isn't it? You know, break into that market. What could you could you imagine the whole of China just or, or are they Paul? Are they like m more and more moving to the steel tip because it's very soft tip orientated, isn't it? Yeah, the, the Far East, especially Hong Kong, Malaysia, Japan, they're, they're very much into the soft tip game. I, I, I got to go over there in early December to, to sample the whole thing, and it is it is rather eye-opening, I've got to be honest. But the more that steel tip is on their TVs, the more they're trying it. And it's the same in European countries where electronic darts yeah. has been the only game they'll ever play. I was, I was over there um, a couple of weeks ago uh, in uh, in Salzburg, just north of there, in a place called March Trank. Okay. And uh, you got all the older players playing soft tip, but you got the younger players playing steel tip. <laughs> right. Now, that says a lot. It to does, me. it does. You look at the telly and they think, well, how can I be successful? It's at steel tip. Yeah. So, um, is there steel big tip money is in the soft only tip? Way to go, in my opinion, for, um, for massive money. Yeah. But if you are in the Far East and you want to try soft tip, it is so enjoyable. Yeah, I can imagine. It's done an amazing job of darts live. It's an incredible sport over there. 
it's, I've never played soft hit, but I love watching the old machines and they play the cricket and that. it does look really good fun. Well, just last of all, what I want to do is, I wondered, obviously, we're at night five um, in the West Point Arena in Exeter on Thursday. I wondered if you could maybe give um, a few of your predictions. So, Go obviously, we start off with Gary Anderson against Rob Cross. What's your thoughts on this one? Oh, that's difficult. I mean, Gary's been playing well the last couple of weeks, but he's really been up against opponents who've been on the game. I mean, that game with Peter Wright and Paul oh, was absolutely that's one of the, sick. That's one of the best games I've ever seen. It was just... He, he didn't get another leg out of the 170 finish, did he? No, uh, well... Did um, he? I don't what think... Was it? it was an 86 finish uh, to get the draw for Gary. Yeah. And that, that bullseye will give him a lot of confidence because the, it's a very short format for Premier League. Um it's almost like a pro to us format with an extra leg. If you oh, sorry, I was talking about. Sorry, Paul, I was speaking about the um, MVG against Gary Anderson. That one. When oh, okay. It, sorry, I was uh, speaking about that one. Sorry, it was my no, fault. He was on about the Peter well, Wright one when they got yeah, the draw. Peter Wright was six three up, I believe, and yeah. Gary reels off three straight, three straight legs. legs. So, uh, an amazing match. Oh, um, you've got to give Gary a lot of credit because at the start of this season, he has had uh, obviously back issues. Yeah. He's, he's got himself under the hands instead of under the knife. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's had a lot of manipulation work and he, he looks like he's thrown very steadily. Yeah. But you just get the feeling that he's playing at roughly the same level as Rob Cross right now. Yeah. And that could well be another draw. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, Daryl Gurney's super chin against Snakebite? Daryl Gurney's obviously chucked away a couple of wins, in my opinion, early doors um, when, he, when he should have had, had points. Um, do you think it's a Peter Wright win? Yeah, I think it is for two reasons. One, current form. I think uh, talking to Peter about the darts that he used last week, he was throwing at a very quick pace. He was, uh, yeah. He's very, very comfortable. With, I, I sincerely hope he sticks with him because his scoring last week, especially at the start of the match, was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and we can't forget as well that this time last year when Peter played at Exeter, he averaged 119 and a half. I oh, know, it's crazy. So he obviously it? likes playing yes, Exeter. Yes, he does, yeah. Is that, that's so, one of the smaller arenas um, on, the, on the thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think we've got the, a nickname. It's the Tin Shed. <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially, that's what it is. But uh, it, it's a slightly different arena. It'll be very different to Berlin. But it, you've got to look at the people playing comfortably in that arena. And Peter's got that experience. And based on the way he's played in the last few weeks, uh, opposed to Daryl's, you've got to fancy a Peter Wright win there. Right. Thank you. So next we've got the gentleman to Sully Rich against MVG. Who are you going for in this one? Cause oh, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but the thing is, Sullivich is he, he does hit massive averages, doesn't he? I know that MVG, I'm like you, MVG will win it, but he does hit big averages loads now, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, th these guys can really, really knock it up a notch when they need to. Uh, Sullivich last week, I was, I was very, very impressed with yeah, the way I was. he played. I mean, he, he keeps himself to himself a lot. He doesn't give a lot away. He'd be a very good poker player, men, so if you want, if you wanted to be. But the, the way he was clinical in closing things out last week, I thought that was very, very impressive. Uh, I'd like to think that he's going to give Michael a game, but Michael has this knack of accumulating points, and he doesn't like the fact that he's not top of the league right now. Uh, so he's only looking one way, and I feel that Michael will get a win here, but I think Mensa will run him close. I, I fancy a, a 7-4 Michael here, and maybe a missed double here or there is going to be the telling difference. Right. Thank you for that. Next, we've got Raymond Van Bardeveld against Bully Boy Michael Smith. I think this is going to be a really good match, especially, especially if Barney turn up. The last couple of weeks, he's, I'm not saying disinterested. He, he hasn't seemed, um, I don't know what the right word is to use, but not seemed himself. Yeah, it's fair to say that, you know, if Barney's come out, he's not a... He's not the youngest of guys anymore. He, he um, does find it hard with all the travelling, and I totally sympathise with that. It's, yeah. it's not an easy schedule when you've been doing Premier League for 10 years. No, I can imagine. Um, as well as other tournaments, of course. Uh, but Michael Smith being a lot more youthful and being top of the table with his confidence. Funnily enough, I'm not really sure why this is, but Raymond seems to be playing late every single time. Yeah, he, he is, isn't he? Past. Yeah. He ain't been on first once, has he? No, and I no. think he'd love to be first. Uh, yeah. Just so he can, he can be, you know exactly when he's going to go on, but he seems to have played, played late you know, the last three or four weeks. But here, Michael Smith, for me, if he starts well, I think he'll get on top of Raymond. We saw the same last week with Raymond when someone got on top of him, he started to shake his head and he looked a bit more lethargic. Yeah, he did. Uh, so it's all about the start for me. If Raymond gets a good start, uh, he might be able to keep Michael at bay. But if Michael gets a good explosive start, 
uh, like he has had uh, in the start of the season, I think he may be too strong for Raymond. And scoring in them videos like he was you the other day or whatever. <laughs> oh, stay tuned for Thursday, you'll see how good he actually was. Oh, I can't wait to see that. And last up, we've got um, obviously Simon Whitlock against Gerwin Price. For me, I think that... Uh, I just want to say this bit, but I think Gerwin, this is one that Gerwin Price really has to win. No, no disrespect to Simon Whitlock, because obviously it was his first loss last week, but what are your thoughts on this one? I agree with you. I think uh, I think Gertie's really got to win this one if he's going to stay in the hunt. Uh, not just to you know look at not being eliminated on judgment night in Belfast, but I feel that if he wants to get some confidence, uh, it, it, this is the, the right kind of match for him right now. Yeah. He's playing someone who's just had their first defeat, yeah. and Simon will admit he didn't play his best game last week in no. Berlin. So maybe this is a great opportunity for Gezi. Uh, I see this being quite a tight match for Monaster. Yeah. Most importantly, this game is all about what Gerwin Price does. Does he have a good start? Does he get some rhythm? Does he start getting his first start right? And most importantly, does he have some aggression? Because there was none of it last week. No, I've never seen him so fat as another thing. It was something in the air in Berlin. It had to be. Yeah, possibly. But I think when we all know that when Gerwin's playing his best starts, and I've played him twice this year, he's, he's beat me in two very close matches. When he's aggressive, he's a different animal. He so he's is. got to be aggressive in Exeter against Whitlock. Otherwise, Whitlock will just plug away at him. Yeah. Well, that is done, Ben. Thank you so much for that. Listen, Paul, um, I'm going to wrap the video up. It's been amazing to have you on the show today. I don't, it's, we're around sort of 30 minutes. That so should be great for the viewers. Um, so thank you so much for coming on today. More than welcome. Really, really enjoyed it. I'm still smart on that. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So listen, guys, thank you so much to all that have watched the video today. Um, for those of you that do like it, please leave a big thumbs up. Uh, turn on your notifications and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. As always, guys, check out dancepanic.tv. Even more so now because I'm going to be setting up an algorithm after this video to be dropping all Paul's videos in the minute they hit YouTube. Um, until next time, guys, that's it. Bye. <laughs>